travel a lot, and sometimes I need to go long distances in a hurry. You know what can cover large distances in a hurry? Yep, a jet. <laughs> so I figured I'd buy myself a personal jet, right? <laughs> Why not? I'd be zipping through the skies in no time, arriving at my destination way before I could get there driving, and we won't even talk about TSA, right? So I shopped around a bit, and whoa, <laughs> jets are seriously expensive. But let, let's say I have plenty of cash. Well, it turns out that there's a quite a bit more to it than just buying a plane. You have to learn how to fly, uh, get all sorts of special jet-related stuff, a hangar, and one of those stylish captain hats. FPGA-based prototyping is a lot like that, too. With an FPGA prototyping board, you can run your design way faster than with simulation or any other method. But it turns out that there's a lot more involved than just buying an FPGA board. You need some really good software tools. The right IP, a flexible hardware solution, a way to run and debug software, some reasonable way to correlate between the FPGA version of your design and the real thing, and, well, there may be a cool hat for FPGA-based prototyping too, but I haven't found one yet. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. There are a lot of FPGA-based prototyping boards on the market. But, besides giving you a big old pile of FPGAs on a board, a lot of them don't really do much to help get you up and running with your actual prototype. My guest today is Jürgen Jaeger from Cadence Design Systems, and we're going to talk about FPGA-based prototyping done right, which involves a lot more than just a bunch of big old chips on some FR4. Before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free tech packet that includes a blog, data sheet, and website all about the Proteum Rapid Prototyping System. Welcome, Jürgen. Thanks for joining me again. It's great to be here again, Amelia. So you and I have talked quite a bit about FPGA prototyping in the past. And even though it's widely used, FPGA prototyping is still mostly considered to be a hack rather than a refined and easy to design verification tool. Why is that, do you think? Well, that is certainly still the perception. But before we go into that, let's first take a look at how the dynamics of SOC in the embedded system market have changed over the last few years. Okay. And change it has. Let's take, for example, the iPad. In its use in April of 2010, over 300,000 of them were sold on the first day. Wow. And more than 200 million since then. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. Absolutely. The success of this new class of mobile devices, as well as the supporting infrastructure has, on the one hand, increased the complexity of today's SOCs, and on the other hand, elevated the importance of any kind of embedded software. Sure. Therefore, the smooth cooperation between hardware and software components is essential and requires new ways of verifying and validating these systems. And FPGA-based prototyping plays a key role in it. All right, so let's talk about that. What are the verification and validation tools that are used in a typical SOC design project? Well, in the early project phases, when the design is still pretty much in flux, you will probably use a lot of software simulation. Okay. At a certain point, a simulator simply doesn't provide enough performance anymore to efficiently verify the design. That's when you add emulation to the picture. At the hardware, the chip design matures. It is time to ramp up on the software side of the project uh -huh. to start early pre-silicon software development. And that's when FPGA-based prototyping is entering the stage. In other words, you want to have a somewhat stable RTL before you implement that in the prototype system. Sure. So I hear all the time how great prototyping is once it's up and running, but oh my goodness, getting there can be painful. You're certainly right with that. FPGA prototyping is a widely used methodology, as you said. I would even go so far to say that almost all SRC designs today are being prototyped in FPGAs, wow. either in whole or in part. Okay. However, the challenge with all current prototyping tools and solutions is that it takes a long time to implement the design into an FPGA-based prototype. Sure. In part because it requires changes to the RTL design and in part because 
there was no easy transition from an existing simulation or emulation environment to the prototype. So Jürgen, yeah. what steps does a typical prototyping bring up involve and how long does it take, do you think? Well, compiling RTL code written for an ASIC design and implementing it in FPGAs requires some preparations and depending on the flow and tools used, quite some rewrite, which can easily take several weeks to do. Things that require attention here are gated clocks, which needs to be converted, latch-based design, tri-states, and so on. Okay. Converting ASIC memories into FPGA memories typically adds another few weeks to it. Right. So the next major phase is to partition the design into multiple FPGAs and add pin multiplexing because a single FPGA usually isn't big enough for the whole design. Sure. Depending if you do it completely manually or with the help of a partitioning tool, this step again can take another two to four weeks. Wow. So now we are ready to do the FPGA place and route and run the design on the FPGA board, but are we really ready? Yeah. How do we know that after all this changes, the functionality of the design got preserved, that what we put into the FPGA really behaves functionally like the original ASIC design? Right, exactly. And in many cases, this is where the fun really starts and requires a lot of time and often many iterations to be confident that the FPGA-based prototype is a functionally correct representation of the original design. Right, yeah. If you add all of this up, it can easily take three months or more to get to a working prototype. Okay, so Jürgen, what are the steps to map one of these SOCs into an FPGA? Okay, the typical FPGA-based prototyping flow includes at the minimum the following step, the RTL compilation or synthesis, okay. multi-FPGA partitioning, yeah. and the final FPGA place and route, which generate the bit files for the FPGAs. Okay, so what's the next step? So the first step is to compile and synthesize the design. For this, Proteum uses the proven Palladium compiler. This assures compatibility with the simulation and emulation environment, enables reuse of existing scripts, constraints, clock definition, memory definitions, and so on. Oh, and by the way, the HDL compiler also runs very fast, up to 30 million gates per hour on a single workstation. In this phase, you would also specify which signals should be probed for debug purposes. Okay. The output is a netlist already optimized for FPGAs, and already having the memories converted into FPGA memories. More on that a little later. Okay, and so what's next? The next step is partitioning the design into multiple FPGAs. Gotcha. As typically the design will not fit into a single FPGA. But partitioning is only part of what's happening here. Other tasks performed are converting gated clocks and latches into FPGA friendly structures, dealing with internal dry states, adding pin multiplexing between the FPGAs, and finally connecting all the external interfaces like PCI Express, UART, graphics ports, Ethernet, and so on to the FPGAs. Sure. All of this is done automatically in the RPP flow. Of course, the user has the option to help and guide the partitioner, usually with the goal to further improve performance of the resulting prototype. This phase generates two things. The individual netlist that go into the FPGA place and all tool okay. and the verification model, in this case a very log netlist that is used to validate that after all the previous steps and transformation, the functionality of the design got preserved. Okay. Very important here is that this validation of functionality is done before the time-consuming FPGA place and all step. This now enables a new level of productivity as all the debug and potential iterations to achieve prototyping functionality and performance goals are done pre place and load, which means that you can do multiple iterations per day. Oh, okay. Finally, we are running the FPGA place and load to generate the individual bit files for the FPGAs. Setup for the place and load tool is also done fully automatically, freeing the user from having to deal with place and load constraints, switches, and time consuming experimentation to get good results. And of course, once the bit files have been generated, you will download them into the FPGAs and you are ready to run. All right. So what does this new flow, this new way of doing prototyping really do for us? You know, in one word, it makes life easier for the user. Great. Okay. It provides very fast compile times. It enables several iterations a day rather than just one iteration every one to two days. Great. 
It automates the mapping of highly complex clocking schemes without user intervention and without changes to the RTL. Excellent. And last but not least, it generates all the constraints, files, options, and so on for the FPGA Blazor Now tool. Something that otherwise is painful, time-consuming, and often ending up with suboptimal results. <laughs> That's true. So. Clocking for SOCs has become really complex, especially for low power designs. Is there something in Proteum that helps the design in this regard? Clocking is definitely one of the biggest headaches when it comes to FPGA-based prototyping. It's yeah. not just the gated clock conversion, that is actually pretty straightforward these days, but more the distribution of many clocks across multiple FPGAs on the printed circuit boards, the sheer number of clocks. Mm -hmm. And when a design is partitioned into multiple FPGAs, primary clocks required for the design have to be driven to all the FPGAs. Right. And these clocks, of course, need to have a tight phase relationship between the FPGAs. Today's designs typically have tens to hundreds of primary clocks with a wide range of frequency requirements. And having that many clocks on the board and distributing them to all the FPGAs is not an efficient solution. No. So what is a better implementation? Well, one of the first steps you want to do is to use the built-in PLLs in the FPGAs to generate these clocks locally rather than distributing them on the board. Gotcha. Okay. This will require only one global clock to be routed to all the FPGAs and the PLL internal generated clocks are then distributed to the rest of the design. Gotcha, okay. Jürgen, it seems like we need something more advanced than that. Am I wrong? You're absolutely right with that. What is needed to support and map even the most complex clocking schemes with unlimited numbers of clocks into FPGAs is a complete clock tree transformation. In Proteum, we do an emulation-like clock tree implementation, basically converting a multi-clock domain design into a single clock domain design ah, okay. from the perspective of the FPGA while oh. preserving the multi-clock behavior from the user perspective. Okay. Doing that has many great benefits. There's absolutely no limitation on the number of design clocks. Automatic conversion of any non-FPGA friendly clocking like gated clocks, multiplex clocks, latches, and so on. The elimination of any whole time violation by construction. Okay and significantly faster place and route times because all the FPGA place and route tool now sees is a single clock design. And best of all, it's done automatically. No user interaction or design changes required. Fantastic. Let's talk about memories just a little bit, Jürgen. FPGAs always have some kind of memory, but normally it's not quite enough. Memory support is certainly another big headache. Yeah. And also, we automatically compile any ASIC memory that fits into the FPGA internal memories. No user interaction required at that point. That is often not enough. Yeah. For large off FPGA memories, the Proteum flow offers now two options. First, a modeling approach, which maps virtually any memory into an 8 gigabyte external memory the XD RAM card, okay. how we call it. Secondly, directly connecting the design's memory controller to the corresponding memory on the donor card. Both approaches have their pros and cons, of course. Yeah. The modeling approach makes it very easy for the user and the Proteum software does all the work. It allows to implement virtually any type of memory and it also offers spectrum memory upload download capabilities. The directly connected approach offers, on the other hand, the highest possible performance, but requires some user interaction and, of course, the availability of the right memory daughter card. Mm, right. Both options can be mixed in a Proteum system, and which one to use depends on user preferences and design requirements. Sure. So, since a lot of us are using FPGA-based prototyping for early software development, we need the prototype to work as fast as possible. Absolutely right. Performance can be viewed as a knob to turn in the Proteum flow. Ah. There is a fully automatic mode where the Proteum software basically does everything automatically, nice. including memory conversion, partitioning, running FPGA plays and out, and so on. The result will be a working prototype within a few weeks or even days in some cases, and running at a performance typically in the 5 to 10 megahertz range. Excellent. In many cases, that will be sufficient but if not, then the user can do some additional manual performance optimizations. How much performance to gain depends on the design itself, 
but also on how much effort and time a user wants to invest. Right. Black boxing, which is somewhat orthogonal to the automatic and manual options, provides a way to encapsulate smaller blocks of the design and completely independently optimize them for performance. Typical use modes for black boxing are to run interfaces like PCI Express at full speed or for legacy IP that nobody really wants to touch anymore. <laughs> right, yeah. The design block in such a black box can easily run at speeds of over 100 megahertz. Wow, okay. So now that we've mapped the design in the FPGA-based prototype and we're running it, but what if on some off, off, off chance there's a bug in it? I know, weird. Oh, how would we debug? Well, first of all, we never have bugs in our designs, right? No, of course not. <laughs> but in case we do, in addition to the usual compiled probes and triggers to capture some predefined signals, Proteum adds some very powerful and unique debug capabilities. Nice. For one, we have something that is called signal monitoring, which allows the user to pull the current state of signals at any time without stopping the prototype execution. This can be very useful to check on key status signals, for example. Force and release is a very powerful interactive debug option that enables to force signals into zeros or ones at any time and release them again at any time. That can be used for design reset, for example, what if scenarios, bring the design into different modes on the fly and much more. Excellent. Memory upload and download allows you to easily change boot codes and other memory contents in the prototype. Great. And last but not least, memory start and stop capabilities provide for a lot of extra runtime control. Excellent. All right, Jurgen, get down to brass tacks with me here. Is Proteum just a box with a bunch of FPGAs in it, or what? Proteum is actually a lot more. Proteum is a new class of highly productive and powerful FPGA-based prototype system, not okay. just a board with some FPGAs on it. Excellent. With a scalable hardware in terms of gate capacity and other options, various degrees of automation to meet performance goals, advanced debug capabilities, and a full complement of interfaces and daughter cards. All those hardware capabilities are supported by a highly productive implementation flow that takes the pain out of mapping an ASIC design into FPGAs. And best of all, unlike typical prototyping, with Proteum, there is no assembly required. And that's fabulous. FPGA prototyping is awesome, but this is just one part of Cadence's ecosystem. How does Proteum fit into the big picture? That is certainly true. Prototyping is part of a continuum of tools and methodologies enabling today's complex SOC and embedded system designs. There will always be software simulation very early in the ASIC design and verification process, emulation to provide high performance in combination with powerful debug capabilities, and then of course prototyping, which starts when the hardware design is stable enough to run software but then provide the platform of choice for early software development and pre-silicon hardware and software integration. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for joining me again, Jurgen. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Amelia. Pleasure is all on my side. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free tech packet that includes a blog, data sheet, and website all about the Proteum Rapid Prototyping System. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out EE Journal's YouTube channel or the on-demand section on eejournal.com.